Good morning, everybody. It's seven o'clock, and today Dr. Nyawonji is going to be leading the discussion on total hip replacement in adult DDH. And after his 30 minute presentation, Mr. Bowers will come in and comment. Um, feel free to comment as well. John, you can go ahead. Morning, everyone. Uh, Morning. Today we're discussing total hypertrophy in the CTH. Um, the outline. Uh, the learning outcome uh, overview of uh, DTH, then we want to understand anatomical abnormalities and classifications, then also appreciate surgical considerations in uh, total hip replacement in a patient with DTH, appreciate key issues in the management of acetabulum uh, in TIH uh, in a patient with the uh, DTH, then appreciate key issues in the reconstruction of proximal femur, then uh, appreciate the role of preoperative templating, then um, also look at uh, complications of TAH in DTH. So, DTH um, uh, entails um, a dysplasia or a balling, uh, looking at the balling socket joint of the hip. Uh, not forming properly in infants and in children. And it's a wide spectrum of alterations uh, from just uh, in, in instability uh, to acetabular dysplasia or proximal femoral dysplasia or both. Or the patient uh, who also may be progressed to have hip subluxation um, or true dislocation uh, of the involved. Uh, yeah. This occurs in a uh, one in a thousand uh, life death, uh, with um, being more common in females. And this um, DDH is a, a cause of secondary uh, hip osteoarthritis in uh, patients with uh, less than 40 years. And um, it uh, becomes it's also a main cause of total hip replacement in young people in about 21 to 29% uh, is um, written by atrophilitis. Then in terms of etiology um, and pathogenesis, uh, adequate growth and uh, development of the assay of the hip uh, depends on concentric positioning of the femoral head into the acetabular cavity and also adequate balance in growth between the triradulate cartilage and the acetabular cartilage. So if the hip is unstable and it's not concentrically uh, reduced or positioned in the acetabular, that details uh, acetabular development. So most of the patients that you're going to see with the, with the DDH, we have the acetabular um, uh, changes then because the hip is not being loaded that also affects the uh, development of the proximal uh, femur as we shall discuss the anatomical changes uh, in a hip. So in terms of uh, theories have been developed, uh, been looked at uh, trying to figure out why these uh, patients develop DDH. So people used to think this is a congenital thing uh, but um, Looking at um, all specimens from um, the children born before the uh, from abortions before 20 weeks of gestation, it has been noted that uh, they don't have any subtle changes or anything to suggest DTH. So uh, anything uh, after the after 20 weeks of gestation is now considered uh, developmental. So this is a developmental condition, and uh, people trying to look at um, being it more common in females. They thought um, high levels of uh, estrogen uh, predispose these patients, but it has been proven not to be. So the only theory left is a mechanical theory uh, supported by patients um, 
a higher feeding position for patients in this position, uh, only by draminos. The first pregnancy being thought that uh, the uterus would be not yet uh, pliable, so as the abdominal muscles and the pelvis. Uh, so there will be a constraint uh, in a constrained environment. Then in multiple pregnancies, then also elevated uh, weight at birth, uh, supporting the mechanical theory. Then also supported by it developing in the left hip due to the positioning of the fetus in utero and um, mothers being encouraged to lie on the left side uh, to, to, to encourage a venous uh, return. Then it can also be associated uh, with the other risk factors with the family history in first degree relatives um, and uh, also hyperlactity conditions like the enlarged downloads and also in patients with the club, uh, club foot. And um, so taking a closer look at the anatomical abnormalities, so we have abnormalities at the acetabular side and at the proximal femoral side. So in the acetabular side, um, as we can see in the x-ray then, the right hip is normal. So comparing the left the right acetabulum with the left one we can see that the left acetabulum is more vertical um, as compared uh, to the right and there's a wide uh, osseous margin um, at the level of the teardrop uh, to the to the collars to the collars line then also um, we cannot see it from here but these patients uh, get um, an acetabular osseous deficiency in the superolateral position and anteriorly. And the acetabulum tends to be uh, uh, more antiveted, uh, which also increases the risk of uh, uh, the hip dislocation. Then some patients may actually develop um, acetabular deficiency, uh, giving a a retrovated acetabulum, which makes uh, total hip replacement in, in those patients very uh, difficult and giving them a higher risk for a post-operative dislocation as compared to the other patients. Then taking a look at the, um, at the, at the proximal femur. So uh, the proximal femur uh, it demonstrates a short neck, then an aspherical a femoral head, as we can see comparing the this left, this plastic left hip to the right. Then we also have an excessive femoral antivision. You cannot appreciate it on this one. Then a posteriorly displaced uh, greater trochanter. Uh, some demonstrate a vulgar neck shaft angle, then hypoplasia of the intramedullary canal. As you can see on this patient, uh, looking at the diameter of the proximal femur, uh, intercortical and intramedullary diameter, the left the proximal femur looks hypoplastic as compared to the right one. Then they can also develop rotational metaphysical diaphysical mismatch. Um, and we shall discuss how we tackle that. Then we can see in this patient, the, the native femoral head is still in the acetabulum, but the whole proximal femur looks proximally migrated so that um, the abductor liver arm and predisposes these patients to uh, ab ab abductor contractures. Then some patients with a severe disease, they can also have contractures of all the other muscles around the hip, the flexors, uh, the uh, M2 uh, and the external rotators also, which might also need to be released uh, when you're doing a total hip replacement. So how do we evaluate this patient? So they usually present with a growing pain. Um, so what we, are, what we should understand about this patient is we're going to get patients with the DDH who have been managed uh, before, then patients with DDH which has been neglected. So 
what brings them to the hospital now is now growing pain and most of them it could be due to secondary osteoarthritis as i've alluded before so we should assess uh, how the pain is limiting their function um, in terms of occupation and day-to-day -day activities uh, waking the patient out now is it now waking the patient up at night uh, any gait disturbances then since this patient is going to have a joint replacement, we want to make sure they don't have any active infection. Then try to elicit or to find out any prior interventions uh, to the hip. Uh, since we need to do a, a thorough preoperative uh, planning, uh, preoperative planning. So some patients might have had um, acetabular, uh, periacetabular osteotomy. Uh, we should take cognizance of that. Um, then patients who have had the proximal femoral osteotomy, we should be prepared for that as it details um, uh, our options for total hip replacement. Then comorbidities goes without saying, since we are waking up this patient for, for a, a, a major procedure. In terms of uh, um, examination, we want to inspect um, their gait um, when they are walking in, uh, taking a look at the hip, any, uh, the position of the hip, uh, any contractures around the hip, the passive range of motion, any surgical scars, any suggestions of active infection in the hip. Then motion, passive and active range of motion. And, uh, and also we should assess uh, particularly the uh, abductor integrity when you're assessing the, the motion. Uh, since um, abductor deficiency or weakness um, predisposes these patients to instability post-operatively. Then for the progressive chest, uh, there's the anterior apprehension chest, and then the, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the other one. Then also uh, we need to assess an, uh, leg length discrepancy, which can either be bony, uh, anatomical, or functional. We will take an in-depth look at that when we do pre, when we go through pre-operative um, uh, planning. So to, to make a diagnosis uh, or to conclude the diagnosis, we need to uh, uh, radiograph, uh, to take a look at the, at the hip. So the series will be an AP uh, of the pelvis, or an AP of the true AP of the hip, uh, lateral, and the false profile view. So this will help us in making um, a diagnosis of DTH. So when there are certain parameters we should we really take a look at, like the lateral center edge angle of Weebeck on the AP view. So this will taking the um, taking a look at the um, top left X-ray. So the center of hip, the center of the femoral head is the reference point. Then we draw a vertical line through that. Then we draw a line from the center of the uh, head of femur to the lateral edge of the of the acetabulum. So in a dysplastic hip, uh, that angle is. Um, is less than 20, less than 20 degrees. Then also in a, in a lateral view, the top right, uh, that, that's the post profile view in the top right uh, X-ray, we measure in the anterior uh, um, center edge uh, angle. Um, so these two angles, you help us uh, to, to, to see that the patient is in a superior lateral and an anterior uh, uh, acetabular deficient, which are hallmarks of uh, uh, acetabular dysplasia in DTA. Then, like I was mentioning, uh, the top, the bottom left x ray is showing an overlap of the anterior wall and the posterior wall. Uh, which which depicts um, uh, retrogression. Then the the 
bottom right uh, X train, it uh, shows us the tonic angle, which is normally less than uh, 10 degrees. If it's more than that, then it uh, entails that the patient is. Um, um, Yes, uh, yes, CTH. Then CT scan, uh, we usually use it for, for uh, pre-operative planning, as we shall see. Then MRI, not so commonly used, but in those patients with the uh, hip pain and um, nothing uh, on examination and on plain radiograph, then we should rule out alternative uh, diagnosis like uh, osteonecrosis and uh, septic leak. Uh, in terms of classifications, uh, the commonly used two classifications are the crow and the atosilacidin. So crow uh, assesses um, the, the proximal displacement of the head neck junction uh, in comparison to the pelvic height as delineated in this uh, in the diagram below. Then also the femoral head uh, subluxation as a percentage of the femoral, um, the displacement of the head neck junction from the teardrop line uh, as a percentage of the femoral head diameter. So um, the more the displacement and the more the subluxation, uh, the higher the, the pro uh, classification. Then the atrophilitis was mainly taking a look uh, or incorporating uh, uh, acetabular uh, uh, dysplasia in, the, uh, in managing um, these patients. So the first uh, group, group A, the dis just dysplasia, then low dislocation and high dislocation, and they are sub they're subclassified as we see uh, in this B1, B2, and C1, C2. So this is the this X-rays are just to illustrate uh, how we're going to see a, 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 on, a, on plain radiograph. So this is a patient with a, a, a tophilitis um, a group A. Uh, the, um, the hip is the, the acetabulum is dysplastic uh, and it's not sublux. But as we see in this one, the true acetabulum is here and the hip is migrated uh, upward but there is still continuation of the false acetabulum with the true acetabulum. But in C, there's complete uh, hip uh, dislocation. So in terms of management, so we shall see that um, for patients with the Crow 1 uh, disease uh, or some Crow 2 disease, um, we care and they are not in pain or they are asymptomatic, our uh, goal of treatment would be to delay onset of um, um, uh, osteoarthritis. So those patients may benefit from realignment in a pelvic periacetabular osteotomy, which depends uh, on whether the triaratic cartilage is still open or it's now closed. Um, but to, to, of interest today, is um, how we're going to manage these patients uh, with a with a total total hip replacement. So in this uh, example, um, I'll just give an overview, then go into in depth about each. So this patient is a a, a crow four a, a, a hip dysplasia or a atrophilitis group a C. As you see, the true acetabulum is here and the hip is dislocated up there. So um, the patient was replaced with the, using a, a medialized uh, acetabular cup. As we can see, the acetabular cup is uh, beyond the collars line medially there. And we try to, uh, the, the, we try to maintain um, to put the hip in the true acetabulum. As we can see here, the false acetabulum has been left alone up there. Then try to cover as much, uh, to get the cup covered as much as we see there's minimal to no lateral overhang of the cup here. Then to increase stability 
uh, augmented uh, with the uh, with this, uh, the cup with the screws. Then uh, a trochanteric osteotomy was done, and also a lesser trochanteric advancement. Uh, this is a modular uh, stem which was used, and all this is cementless. So this is the most the recommended for a total hip replacement in a patient with a, a, a hip dysplasia. You get better results with both, uh, with a cementless uh, acetabular cup and a cementless stem, and it's better to use a modular, uh, a modular stem. Then in terms of the weight bearing, uh, it's encouraged to, uh, better results has been seen with the, with the, with the ceramic on ceramic, uh, especially in the young patients. Then people uh, also discuss the use of um, hip resurfacing in, um, um, in patients with hip dysplasia. Those have been shown to have high uh, revision rates and also high dislocation rates uh, post-operatively. So they've been set aside. So key issues in the management of the acetabulum so the major issue is the bone stock deficient in the superolateral uh, position and anteriorly. Um, and also a, 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 cup deficient, a cup position, as I have alluded that a medialized cup um, in the true acetabulum, um, uh, you get a, a good hip biomechanics. And if the cup, is um, put in a is lateralized and also is put high, uh, 25 centimeters in in both direction, 25 millimeters in both directions. That um, increases joint reaction forces and shear forces on the um, on the new hip and the wear rate, polyethylene wear rate also increases. So it's better to put it in the native um, acetabulum uh, and medialize it. So the techniques for acetabular uh, reconstruction in those patients with severe uh, bone um, deficit. Uh, so in diagram A, uh, it's just showing that uh, the, the hip has been put uh, in, the, in the native in the native uh, acetabulum, then in B, and there's good uh, coverage uh, of the acetabular cup um, with a minimum lateral overhang. So what we're aiming for is to get at least 70% of acetabular cup uh, coverage. Then in B, um, then in B, it's showing um, augmentation with an allograft uh, at the uh, superolateral uh, uh, superolateral corner to to augment the um, acetabular defect. Then in, in C, uh, there was use of a mosellized uh, cancellous bone graft. Then in D, it's depicting that we can also make use of a vascularized a bone graft, which has been shown to have better results as compared to the strat allograft or motilized uh, bone graft. Then in E, uh, it shows the um, use of the whoop um, uh, trabecular, uh, a, a, whooped, um, a, a whooped cage um, to augment the acetabular bone defect. So this has been shown to do better as it uh, optimizes um, the positioning of the of the cup. Um, then in F, uh, the use of um, a trabecular metal, uh, made from tantalium. So this has been shown to encourage, uh, uh, they are very porous and encourage uh, rapid uh, bone growth. And they've been shown to, to be the best um, um, uh, to use in terms of the um, acetabular bone defect. 
then down there are the other um, uh, techniques, uh, G and F, where we are medializing um, the acetabular cup by doing a cotyloplasty. Uh, so it can be augmented with the cantilus, impacted cantilus bone graft uh, by and it has been shown to, to have a very good result and um, improving a hip a biomechanics also, but it's discouraged in patients with a, a medial bone wall of less than a 10 millimeters. And key issues in the reconstruction of the proximal femur, uh, ante, version uh, angle of the femur, so we talk of the, the combined uh, angle. Uh, it's encouraged to keep the combined angle after total arthroplast uh, in uh, DDH to be less than 55 uh, degrees. Uh, we shall talk more about it when we do uh, templating. Then shortening of the, of the femur, we shall discuss more about it. Uh, so shortening of the femur would be either um, a metaphysial, uh, or subtrochanderic or, or shaft, or they can be done in the distal femur, trying to uh, regain uh, an, a normal antivision of the proximal femur, and also to, uh, to counter for the leg, uh, leg length discrepancy and complications uh, associated with it. Then it also helps us. Um, we should take into consideration selection of a proper stem um, to deal with both uh, the fixation and uh, the osteotomies that we're going to do, um, and also um, a, a long-term durability and uh, osteointegration. So these are the techniques for proximal femoral uh, reconstruction. And, um, some uh, in, in A, some uh, authors um, advocate for a femoral destruction in those patients with the hip uh, dislocation, that's uh, the crow 4 and the atrophilacid uh, uh, C, to do a pre op um, femoral, uh, a pre op destruction using an external fixator. Uh, then, uh, uh, proceed with the total hip replacement after. Then some actually go radical to go in and um, yeah, do a proximal femoral uh, preparation, then do destruction. Um, but it doesn't uh, be shown to be any superior uh, to, to subprochemary uh, osteotomy. So in um, in E, just uh, A, B to E, just depicting uh, the various options for trochanteric osteotomy and uh, uh, metaphysical osteotomy. Then uh, F and G uh, are describing the subtrochanteric osteotomy, which can either make use of the chevron, uh, double derotational chevron osteotomy in F and in G, that's a transverse, a trochanteric osteotomy. Uh, then G is um, yes, uh, showing um, the Z uh, osteotomy in the shaft, but you can also use it in the subtrochanteric region. Um, and the various fixations that can be done, we can use the osteotomy as the bone to augment uh, the osteotomy and fix with either K wires, a cabling, or if the or plating, and you can see in I, it's a distal, it's a distal femoral osteotomy. So all these osteotomies uh, help us to regain a femoral antevision and also to to deal with the leg length discrepancy. Then some of the uh, the surgical considerations will be evaluating the preoperative leg length discrepancy. Relocating the hip center, predicting the use of uh, shortening or shorten, then choosing appropriate implants and achieving, and uh, we want to achieve a uh, primary uh, stability. So, how do we make sure we achieve all those uh, considerations by doing a preoperative templating? 
So with this one, we determined that atomic acetabular location, evaluate acetabular bone stock, then measure the height of the femur head, this location, and also determine a uh, combined um, uh, antivision. So we make use of plain radiographs and CT scan. So 3D CT scan has been shown to, um, to be the best when doing a preoperative um, templating. Um, with radiographs, um, there's the concept of uh, the Ranawat triangle. This helps us locate the native um, uh, acetabulum. So with the AA line, that's the inner teardrop line, then we locate the small A point, five millimeters lateral to the teardrop. And the, a, the ABC triangle is an isosceles triangle, right, uh, right angle at angle B, and AB and BC are equal. So using this concept, it helps us locate the, uh, um, the native um, the acetab the, the true acetabulum. Then intraoperatively, we can also make use of a in image intensifier to locate the true acetabulum if, uh, if it proves difficult to do it, um, um, to locate it physically. Then acetabulum uh, bone stock, uh, mainly with the CT, but uh, postoperatively, we can measure the cap coverage um, by using um, 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 a ratio between a measure this from the collars line to, to where the cap ends, and also from the collars line to the uh, lateral margin of the, of the acetabulum. So in, in this in this patient, um, our ratio will be B will be A over um, will be B over A. That's the ratio from the collars line to the acetabular edge. That's B divided by uh, divided by A. That gives us our acetabular coverage. And we said we are aiming for seventy percent. That gives us uh, optimal uh, optimal uh, stability. Then this is uh, it just illustrating the concept that we have discussed to measure the leg length discrepancy. So we can make reference of the teardrop uh, line, then measure um, the, the differences in the two hip from the teardrop line to the, to the head neck uh, junction and compare both sides. Or we can use the tip of the greater trochanter as shown on the extra on the right. Um, from the making reference to the teardrop line, but some authors um, um, make reference to the um, um, to the SI joint by drawing a line uh, joining the most inferior portions of the SI joint, said to be more more accurate. Then the combined um, undervision angle measured using CT scan. So the section above has shown the uh, antivision for the for the acetabulum. Then the ones below showing the antivision of the of the femur in relation to the distal femoral uh, condyle. So that's what we said. The optimal THA would be we need to keep it below. Um, uh, 55 when we when we doing the total hip replacement. This is just to illustrate how we're going to measure the the leg length discrepancy. So in diagram A, uh, showing the a bony uh, leg length discrepancy is shown by differences in in the true length from A to B minus C to D. Then in B, it's showing a functional. Um, in anatomical uh, leg length discrepancy, we'll be using anatomical landmarks to measure the leg length discrepancy. Uh, so it would be EF minor, uh, uh, from GH that will give us the leg length discrepancy. Then some patients may not have any of these discrepancies, but 
the patient feels that they are, one of their limbs is short and it could be either due to the hip changes or uh, they are now developing a, a pelvic, lumbar pelvic um, changes which gives them a, an upper and leg length equipment. So you might measure that functional leg length using blocks as shown in diagram C. Um, so we can know patients can do very well with the leg length equipment of two centimeters or less, and uh, there's less risk of a, a neurovascular injury. Um, so in those patients, we might not do a sub a, a, a sub secondary prostration, but in uh, patients with the leg length equipment above two centimeters, especially four centimeters and above, it's associated with a high risk of neurovascular damage. So we should preoperatively plan for a subtrochanteric a shortening or shorten. Um, so as shown in this diagram, uh, from after calculating the leg length equipment, then we can plan how we're going to do our shortening. So demonstrated here is a, a Z, um, Z plus, um, and the, in this patient on the right, on the right, on the left side, it, um, the subtrochanteric prostrotum was augmented with the with the K1. Um, then also we have to plan for 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 implants that we're going to use uh, and the osteotomy that we're going to 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 do. So for all the patients that you who have subtrochanteric osteotomy done, the fixation of the femoral components depends on the fixation of the implant on the distal on the distal fragment. Then the stability and maintenance of vision of the proximal fragment of the osteotron depends on the configuration of the implants that we are going to use. So all the osteotronies have been done to, to do the same fairly well, but um, most, most authors favor the Z plus saying that it maintains the vision better than the other. Then prediction of the processes, so recommended would be a, a cementless cup. Um, and um, in, in the femoral stem, recommend, um, fav favored if you're going to be using a monoblock stem, is a two-third uh, uh, coated uh, stem. It has been shown to give, give better initial stability as compared to the proximally uh, coated stem. Then um, modular stem used uh, shown to do better, especially in these patients where the problem of femoral anatomy is unpredictable. So it allows us to play around with what we have until we get what the patient needs. Then in severely dysplastic problem of femur, um, we can uh, make use of customized femoral stem. Then in terms of the hearing surface, some most authors recommending a, a ceramic on ceramic in young patients uh, to reduce uh, weight. Then complications, uh, sciatic nerve palsy, um, is seen with the lengthening more than four, uh, four centimeters. Then hip dislocation is also a big problem. Then component loosening um, is also seen, um, especially for patients who get uh, a cemented acetabular component they get dramatic loosening after 10 years. And periprosthetic fractures and infection are also encountered. Thank you. Maybe the faculty can comment. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Bowers, you can take over. Hello, can you hear me? No? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, John, for a very good uh, comprehensive um, uh, uh, lecture. Um, I think the, what you can see from, from all of this is that dealing with the, um, the uh, just plastic hip is not an easy operation and it's certainly full of uh, uh, pitfalls so 
is when you see a dysplastic hip and even a very mildly uh, dysplastic hip like a, a crow A, um, you've got to, there's a lot of um, pitfalls that you need to uh, look at and pre-plan well before the, the operation. So this, you know, don't think that this is a standard, uh, standard hip replacement. And certainly once you get to um, the, uh, the, the uh, more dysplastic ones where the uh, femur is completely uh, dislocated out of the acetabulum. That does uh, require a lot of uh, ex expertise. So um, just be careful when you're looking at, at x-rays um, of patients who have developed uh, early arthritis and uh, make sure that you're not dealing with a dysplastic uh, hip. So patients with um, the um, early Crow uh, classifications, you, you'll notice that the patient is usually in their 30s to their 40s. So it's a, usually a younger patient and due to the abnormal biomechanics, uh, these patients develop osteoarthritis uh, really quite, quite early. Um, but in those patients, the acetabulum is con partially contained, so the femoral head is partially contained in the acetabulum, but you just have to look at these x-rays and if you feel and can see from the x-ray that there's under coverage of the femoral head, shortening of the femoral neck, uh, just be careful that you're not dealing with a dysplastic uh, hip. Um, these patients, norm, so just dealing with the ones that are not completely dislocated, which is the, the one that you tend to see a lot more often. Um, you also have to prepare uh, and decide what you're going to do for each, each patient. These patients often require much smaller implants. Uh, the acetabulum is usually significantly smaller and the femur, um, especially the intermodality canal, is very narrow in these patients. So you sometimes need to have on your shelf uh, uh, much smaller, smaller implants. So coming to the acetabulum, as uh, John mentioned, the cavity is very flattened. So the first thing you have to do is you have to re quite medially. Usually these patients have a lot of bone medially because the acetabulum has been lateralized. And it's quite important that you re-establish um, as much as you can the, the uh, normal anatomy uh, in these patients. So you have to ream quite significantly medially. And if you do that, you, you'll find that the acetabulum does, does tend to fit, um, but usually with a much uh, smaller cup. And also it's quite important to correct any abnormal version uh, in the cup. So don't when you're inserting your cup, don't follow the anatomy of the patient. Um, otherwise, you malposition the cup and that's associated with a high risk of uh, dislocation. So coming to the femur, the, the neck is usually short. It's usually antiverted. So you cannot use the normal um, parameters that you use for... for uh, putting the femoral stem in the right position. So the calcar will be antiverted and it's important that you retrovert your stem when you're putting that in. So you cannot use the calcar as a reference, which is what you do with the normal hip. That's why I say it's important that you identify dysplasia before you operate, because you'll, you'll get this all wrong. Um, it's much more difficult to, do, to use with a cemented stem because often with a cemented sorry, with an uncemented stem, because often with an uncemented stem, um, the position is dictated by the, the rima. Now, the advantage of using a cemented stem is that you can rotate the stem within the cement mantle. So make sure that you have uh, smaller implants. The, int the medullary canal is usually very narrow, and sometimes uh, you're looking at six and eight millimeter uh, medullary canal diameters. So be prepared to use a much smaller stem. Also be prepared to have intermodality remas because sometimes the same stem uh, intermodality canal is so small 
that you have to ream out the medulla before you can get a decent uh, standing. Uh, the crack trochant is usually posterior, but that's usually not a problem. The abductors are very short, and sometimes you have to uh, lengthen them. And in the very severe uh, cases, you have to almost do what's called a hanging hip. So you have to take a lot of the um, muscles around the hip and release them. Um, and that predisposes to instability, and then you have to use a dual mobility cup. Um, as John mentioned, you sometimes have to osteotomize the femur and you have to lengthen the leg and you have to be very careful with the lengthening with regard to stretching the sciatic nerve and resulting in sciatic nerve palsy. So if you're going to do a significant amount of leg length, uh, lengthening, uh, be, be sure that you uh, manage the patient postoperatively with a flex near the uh, extended hip to reduce uh, tension on the sciatic nerve. Um, if you can't get the cup into the right position, you can use uh, the femoral head to augment the lateral aspect of the cup. Um, they can, these bone grafts can resorb, so we're tending to use a lot of trabecular metal augmentations, uh, which are giving much better results. We tend not to use a cage, as I saw one of your diagrams had a cage. These acetabulums are very small and the cage makes them even smaller. So the implant that you put into the cage usually is a bit too big. So we're tending to use a lot of trabecular metal uh, augmentations. And if you need to plan for this, you normally need a very detailed CT evaluation, especially in the, in the more complex cases. There's a new implant called a trabecular shell that works very well, if you ream out the acetabulum, and if you don't have full coverage, you can put a titanium trabecular shell into the acetabulum and basically make your own acetabulum from this. You get very good uh, bone incorporation into these shells, and you can put whatever liner that you want, and if uh, you can put an uncemented liner, you can put a cemented liner, and it works very carefully, uh, very well. Um, if you're worried about instability, then you use these new dual mobility uh, um, devices, which dramatically reduce your dislocation rate. Um, the stem, you have to make sure that uh, what you're going to do about that is they're usually smaller stems, and often you need to use um, modular stems. So the stem, I tend to use the restoration stem which results in distal uh, fixation. So it doesn't matter what osteotomy is, you do proximally, you still get a very good uh, distal fixation. So just in summary, uh, uh, dealing with these dysplastic hips is not easy. There are significant pitfalls on both the acetabular side and on the femoral side. So, um, before you tackle these hips, you need quite a lot of experience with, with normal uh, hip replacements because um, they are, you know, on both sides, you can easily get things wrong. That's, that's all my comments uh, so far on this, on this talk, which was very good. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Nyonzi. All right, Dr. Tando. Are you still in the meeting? Yes. Um, th thank you, John, for the yes, uh, for the nice you, uh, presentation. Nice. Sorry. Let, let me just put my video on. Okay. Anyway, let, let me continue. Um, for for the trainees, uh, for the fellowship exam, uh, 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 from your examiner, I would pose the following questions to you. And uh, the first one would be for you to to look at the. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes you can go ahead. 
Oh yeah. Uh, so so I was saying for the for the trainees, I'd actually like like you to tell me about the natural history of uh, DDH. And uh, in answering that question, you have to quote Weinstein. And the purpose of you understanding the natural history of DDH is uh, for, for, for the prognostic value uh, to, the, to the parents when they ask about the outcome of uh, DDH in their child as well as for you to be able to anticipate how those patients do throughout their lifetime and when they will come in for, for arthroplasty. Um, and then uh, another thing which I would like trainees to be able to master is templating of uh, total hips in the setting for uh, adult DDH. And um, in addition, you should be able to draw the tonus angle and the sharp angles and, and calculate them. Um, that you should be quite comfortable with. And uh, when you get to the clinical case uh, stations, if you get a, a, a DDH, you should be able to uh, be uh, conversant with uh, discussing surgical challenges that you anticipate in a DDH case. Um, uh, for example, the issues of uh, uh, taking the bone stocks in the acetabulum uh, taking a uh, vision in the femur and in cases of bad prior surgical interventions are you going to do staged or single staged um, uh, surgery uh, if, if there is any hardware and uh, the pitfalls of a uh, sclerotic um, uh, bone in, in, in the setting of patients of bad uh, prior uh, inter interventions on how can make a uh, surgery difficult. So that's for the trainees. Um, for the surgeons, uh, perhaps if, if I may get a, a picture on how common uh, these adult DDH cases are in, in Zimbabwe, how many cases do they see and operate in, in a year? Um, also, in, in Zimbabwe, we, we've got a problem with the uh, unavailability of uh, allograft bone. So any advice on, on what they, they do for the acetabular uh, bone, bone defects? And then uh, perhaps to Mr. Bowers in particular, do you see any future of hip preservation surgery in Zimbabwe? Thank you. All right, Mr. Bowers, your mic is, uh, yeah, it was still muted. Yeah. You can go ahead now. Okay, uh, the first question was, um, how many cases do, do we see? Um, certainly the, the, the um, lower crow classifications, you see quite a few. I see about between six and eight um, of these patients a year. Um, the very severe ones, um, with complete uh, dislocation of the femur from the acetabulum, I would only see those once every uh, two to three years. Um, those are very complex procedures, so uh, that require quite a lot of um, implant variation um, and a lot of implants on, on the that you have to have on in stock. So. Those patients, I've done a couple. I normally uh, get some help from a, uh, a surgeon that has done many of these uh, before because they, they're really extremely difficult. If it requires too much implant uh, variation, it's one of the very few patients that I would send to, to a, a center that does these uh, regularly because they're extremely, extremely complicated uh, procedures. Um, with the use of um, allograft in Zimbabwe, it's, it's near to impossible to, to, uh, to get allograft. 
Um, fortunately, when you're doing these patients, the first thing you do with a hip replacement is you remove the femoral head, and that gives you a, a lot of bone graft to, to utilize during the procedure. So I've never found the need for allograft. And the second thing is um, allograft has essentially been overtaken by trabecular metal implants. So um, it's hardly ever now that surgeons are using, using allografts for, for this uh, procedure. Um, there was one more question which I cannot remember. Um, Tando, can you just remind me of the third thing? Um, I, I was saying, do you see any future for hip preservation surgery in, in Zimbabwe? Um, yes, by one of uh, you guys. Um, so basically, by hip preservation, you're talking about uh, femoral osteotomies and acetabular osteotomies. Yes, uh, yeah, acetabular osteotomies, femoral, yeah. and, and probably hip scopes as well. Yeah, so um, th that used to be a, a very common operation for, for uh, dysplastic, dysplastic hips. Um, fortunately, now the the uh, hip implants are giving such good uh, longevity. Um, um, the uh, new uncemented hip implants with the uh, more sophisticated uh, um, bearings, um, such as ceram um, ceramic uh, on ceramic or ceramicized metal, which is what I use, auxinium. Uh, these patients are giving results of hip uh, survivorship of between 20 and 30 years. So uh, the, the need to, to complicate things further by doing femoral osteotomies and acetabular osteotomies is reduced. And you should always uh, look at the poor hip surgeon that has to put a hip replacement in the femur that you've osteotomized and completely change the proximal anatomy of that hip. So be very careful about doing hip pres preservation surgery that kills the chance of doing a hip replacement further. If you do a femoral, proximal femoral osteotomy and you destroy the canal uh, that you need to put your hip in, um, that's an extremely bad thing to do. Because um, then you, at the time of the hip replacement, you have to do another uh, femoral osteotomy. Coming to uh, surface uh, replacements in the low crow, crow classifications, you can use the uh, Birmingham type uh, resurfacing. And uh, certainly um, the proponents of Birmingham uh, hip replacements have used that a lot, but usually only when the um, acetabulum is uh, reasonably covered and the femoral head is well within the acetabulum. So that can be used if you consider that hip to be hip preservation. I think anything more than that, you need to go on to a standard, uh, standard hip replacement. So again, the important thing here is preoperative pre -operative planning like you've never done before. And uh, you have to work out, especially in our environment, uh, whether you import a, a, a lot of uh, uh, various sizes of trabecular metal augments, various sizes of different uh, acetabular cups, and uh, si sizes of much smaller stems. Uh, one of the patients I did, I actually had to use a pediatric uh, femoral stem because it was so small. But uh, I was able to predict that preoperatively by looking at the femoral canal, and I specifically ordered a stem that was three sizes lower, smaller than the standard stem. So I think it's quite important to you, you preoperatively plan because intraoperatively, if you use the smaller stem and you can't put that in, you're in big, big trouble. So yeah, be careful with these, uh, these patients. And a few patients uh, 
particularly when they're completely dislocated, I would send you to a surgeon that has done several of these uh, regularly. Thank you. Um, perhaps if I may ask uh, Mr. Nube Senior to share some some of his experiences uh, with with his dysplastic hips and. Uh, Perhaps uh, one more question would be the the role of fluoroscopy in aiding the positioning of uh, of the implants too, uh, Mr. Nube Senior. <coughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, generally, I tend to deal mainly with the glow one or two. I rarely go to glow three or four because they they are obviously very, very difficult to deal with. But having said what I've just said is I really, I, I only see maybe about one in about in two or three years, and that's the, 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 the most I tend to deal with. Um, I rarely use the, the, the image assistance during the course of the operation, I must admit. Uh, maybe I should uh, take that into cognizance and start using, using this more often but I tend to deal with the, what I can see during the course of the procedure. Um, Pre-operative pre planning has always been difficult for me uh, simply because uh, most of the cases I tend to deal with, well, first of all, I've always been using the, the Chanley type of uh, processes and things like that, the, 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 the modular, the monoblock stem and things like that, but I've since moved from that and now and gone to the to the to the modular stems using the B Pro systems uh, and then the uncemented cup, and I've been quite happy with, with with that. But not when it comes to the to the DDH cases, and the DDH cases will almost always require, um, in my hands, I've always been happier using a cemented uh, a cup. Hopefully, this will probably position the and also trying to position the cup as best as, as I can. Uh, and I use very little in the form of for uh, uh, femoral osteotomies, and I, I really do any pelvic any pelvic osteotomies when when I deal with these cases. That's uh, uh, that's my input when it comes to DDH. Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Nguyen. Um, perhaps, uh, Mr. Mekeza, if you can share your experiences at Parenyata uh, with regard to these uh, dysplastic hips. Mr. Magaza. Have we lost Mr. Magaza? Okay, I think we've lost uh, Mr. Magaza. Um, are there any uh, senior colleagues who would like to share some pearls of wisdom with regard to DDH? Just um, just let me know. Okay, I think um, if there's no further comments, I think we can, it's uh, three minutes past, past eight. Are there any burning issues from the um, trainees with regard to dealing with this um, very difficult situation? Any further questions from the trainees? Okay, looks like there's no questions from the trainees. Okay, it, it leads me to, to thank everybody for, for joining this, uh, um, this webinar. And I, I need to thank uh, uh, John Yamunzi for um, presenting dysplastic uh, hips in a very precise way. I think everything that he's mentioned 
is very important when it comes to, uh, particularly with his, to his exam. So uh, thanks very much, and we will see you next week at the same time. Thank you. The meeting is now closed. Goodbye.